Yes. Your Holiness, uh, thank you and good morning. Today we will turn our attention to matters of the mind and the brain. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, um, for Your Holiness' sake and for those around, to just very, very briefly remind us that the brain is probably the most complex piece of matter in the universe. It has about 100 billion neurons. It has about one and a half trillion connections among those neurons. Now, interestingly, more than 40% of the human brain is in the frontal lobe. And we'll be hearing more about the frontal lobe as we go through today and tomorrow. During early pregnancy in humans, there are about 250,000 new neurons that are grown every minute, quarter of a million per minute during early pregnancy. On the other hand, in adults like us, about 85,000 cortical neurons, neurons in the cortex, die every day, about 85,000. So it's a very dynamically changing process, constantly changing. The brain, although it's a relatively small organ, uses 20% of the total body's oxygen supply. So it is, demands more oxygen than any other organ. And today we're going to begin to address some key challenges that Your Holiness posed regarding the mind and the brain. Is consciousness a primary phenomenon that transcends biology? We will address the issue of downward causation that we... Downward. Is there a place in the brain where the self might be located? We will also... What is the relation between first and third person accounts? of mental and brain activity. And we'll also address the possibility of free will from the perspective <coughs> of modern neuroscience, which we'll continue to discuss for the next several days. And certainly that has very important ethical implications. This morning, Wolf Singer, who you first met, I think, in Washington at the Washington meeting, is one of the most eminent neuroscientists in the world today. And um, we are so incredibly fortunate to have Wolf as part of uh, our Mind and Life family. And uh, he will begin this morning by introducing some of the, these key issues uh, in the context of modern neuroscience. So I turn it over Thank to you. Wolf. Good morning, His Holiness. I'm very, very honored to sit here and have the privilege to try to explain some of the um, mechanisms that we think we understand in the brain. And uh, let me start with something that we discussed last night at dinner. Mm -hmm. um, after we have heard from the quantum physicists that there is randomness, unreliability, non-causality, um, it occurred to me as a, as a biologist that all these properties had to be overcome by nature in order to make it possible to develop life on this planet. Because if things were random, unreliable and non-causal, no life would be possible because there would be no solid structures and there, it would be impossible for life to maintain itself in homeostasis. So maybe it's an enormous progress to have overcome the laws that govern the very small in order to make life possible. While we probably needed all these mechanisms in order to transform energy into structure. But this is just a speculation. Mm -hmm. Now, 
So, <coughs> I would like to talk a little bit about the implications that modern brain research has on classical philosophical questions. Because brain research, coming from the bottom, starts to explore more and more phenomena that have been traditionally been dealt with by philosophers, people of humanity sciences. And so neurobiology <coughs> has something to say on epistemology, how objective our perception is, because we work with the organ that perceives. The mind-body problem, the big question of how mental qualities can arise from interactions among material objects, in our case, neurons. The constitution of the self, um, Ritchie has already addressed the question, is there a place in the brain where the self has its home, decides, plans, acts, takes responsibility, or is there no such place? Is the self outside somewhere? Is the self continuing after the neurons are all dead? All these questions are questions that the neuroscientists now discuss. And finally, there is uh, this discussion on free will, which is becoming very important for um, the uh, moral philosophy of ethics, because <clears throat> if everything that we can do is prepared by these neurons, how responsible can we be? <coughs> what is our definition of guilt? How does this relate to punishment? So things become very interesting now. And I think we watch a time. Let's have a look around. Let's have a look around. Let's have a look Let's have a look around. Let's have a look around. Let's have a look Let's have a look around. 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 Let's have a look I just wanted to emphasize, underline the point that you are making that in the uh, traditionally these areas have been pretty much reserved for the philosophers, but now as a result of new findings, mm -hmm. discoveries in brain science, yeah. you are able to address some of these. Yeah. So what happens here in this very moment that oh. scientists talk to, oh. to oh. philosophers uh, is, is also starting to happen in the West now. And so we have the same problems everywhere. Um, <clears throat> before I go explaining some of the data to you, I would like to, I don't have to remind you about this, but I think it's important to make this point at the beginning of, of a talk on brain, um, that we can, of course, only imagine, understand, think, reason what the brain allows us to think because it is the organ that does all this. And we know that the brain is the product of evolution. I think everybody mm -hmm. agrees now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we know the criteria that have been applied or that are applicable to explain evolution. This is the organism has to survive and to reproduce. And in order to do this, the organism has to get signals from the world that are relevant for survival. Nothing else is important. Not important for the organism to understand um, the absolute truth. It's important for the organism to recognize a lion and to run away quickly. So the criteria according to which the cognition has been, or the cognitive system has evolved, are not the criteria that one wants to apply in order to generate a cognitive system that is able to understand the last truth. All that was required is a system. Last truth, Okay. 
Right? You would agree? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so this has, this has, of course, consequences. Because <clears throat> our brain and our cognition could only adapt to the world that is the world of us living beings. It's the world of classical physics. Mm. It's the world of solid objects. It's the world in the millimeter to meter range, because this is what is important for us. It's not the world of the quanta. It's not the world of the universe. We don't have to know about the universe in order to survive on this planet. <laughs> <coughs> and the consequences <laughs> that our cognition must be <laughs> limited. It must have boundaries. It's not possible otherwise, because the criteria according to which it developed are very, very selective and constrained. This means, and, and I think the days we had behind us when we were all puzzled by the quantum physicists who told us things that we cannot imagine, here we really <laughs> felt how our cognition is limited, <coughs> that we cannot feel and understand properly that these things happen. Why? Because we have not been built for it. And this may apply also for other questions. And so I think humbleness is something we need to keep in mind when talking about what I'm saying in the future, because it may be only a very limited explanation of something much bigger. So what do neuroscientists believe? So we have very strong beliefs um, and one is that all the knowledge that the human being can have and all the programs according to which this knowledge is used, the programs that make our reasoning, um, so the way in which we apply this knowledge, that all this is contained in what we call the functional architecture of the brain. So the way in which neurons are connected to each other. There's nothing else in the brain but neurons and the way in which they are connected. And out of this uh, emerges an extremely complex dynamics, spatio-temporal patterns of activity. And the architecture that makes these activities possible is the storehouse of all our knowledge and of all the programs according to which this knowledge is used. It's very much different from a computer where you have a memory and a processing unit and some periphery, here is all together in the functional architecture. Mm. So, <clears throat> this reduces questions like, where does all this knowledge come from? Where does the brain have its knowledge from? Becomes reduced to the question, what are the factors that made this functional architecture? Mm. And there is again evolution, then development, because human brain develops until age of 20. So some of the younger monks still have developing brains, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> they can learn much. <laughs> and during this um, development after birth, the functional architecture of the neurons, the way in which they connect, is modified by experience. So the brain adapts itself to, to reality in which it is born. But much is already inherited from evolution. So we know what our ancestors, the snails and lower animals, mm -hmm. have learned about the world. And I will give you an example that the way in which we learn about causality mm -hmm. has already been understood by snails and put into molecular machinery that's still working in our brain. So. Um, we sit on their shoulders mm. in our understanding of the world. Um, and then there's, of course, learning that, that you and me still can do to some extent because the connections between neurons, they remain a little bit flexible even in the adult, fortunately. Mm. 
Not very hopeless, right? <laughs> <laughs> total hopeless, I remember that. So he's saying, so that means it's, it, we are not totally hopeless case. <laughs> <laughs> now, this has again important implications because um, this knowledge, which is already in the brain, is used in order to reconstruct the image of the world that we have. Because um, if you think that in, in the back of your eye, on the retina, all you have is a two-dimensional homogeneous distribution of different brightness values, nothing else. Then no objects or so. You use your knowledge in order to put all this in order and segment this from the background and identify it as an object. And um, so if we had not had all this a priori knowledge in our brain that we know from evolution and from early development and from learning, we would not be able to perceive anything. We use this knowledge in order to categorize the world, identify <laughs> objects, make sense out of it. And we do this obviously in a very specific way. It could have been done otherwise, but the world is as it is. We evolved in this world and so we do it that way. But maybe there's another way. We don't know. So, an important point is that evolution is very conservative. Um, mechanisms that have been developed sometime during early uh, existence of life, like in, in this funny snail, they are preserved until the higher, until the, they are the same in the neurons of our brains. So the molecules of the neurons of this snail are the same as the molecules in the neurons of our brain. The mechanisms by which the snail learns that, for example, simultaneity means there's a relation or B follows A, that A is probably the cause of B if it always comes at the same time. All this is already realized in molecular machinery, which the snail has in its brain, and we have exactly the same. And this is the reason why we interpret simultaneity as something that establishes a relation or a sequence A preceding B, then a being the cause of B and not B the cause of A because the molecular machinery is of that kind. Another fascinating thing is, and I think this is important both for, I think for all religious systems and philosophical systems that talk about two entities, matter and mind, is the evolution of the brain itself. <clears throat> with the... Um, with the invention of the cerebral cortex, which is the structure oops, that, um, what's going on? Um, yeah. Which, which is the, this part here of the brain. It, it first came into, on, on the earth, at the level of birds, reptiles. They have a primitive cortex, wow. but they already have it. <coughs> and then on this long way over, um, over cats and monkeys until finally to man, no new structure has been invented. It's only more of the same. We have more of this. We have only more of cerebral cortex, but nothing new, no new structure. And this raises a big problem because it is impossible to say that um, there is a, a, a categorical jump somewhere where, for example, the mind uh, could have entered this system. Um, it's a continuous process, and new functions emerge 
from increasing complexity, but it's just repeating the same principle of organization, uh, making a system more and more complex by adding always similar elements. And this makes the difference between monkey, which jumps out there, has no culture, and us who sit here and have culture. But there's a gradual change, and we can discuss what the main difference is, um, and it has to do with the ability to... The, the culture is the middle core. Right. So in what sense you're using the term culture here? Culture I use in terms of being able to invent um, systems like um, philosophical systems, ah. religious systems, oh. art, science, hmm. Everything that distinguishes us from monkeys, yes, yes, yes. which is a lot. So, <laughs> so when it comes to jumping, that part of the culture, monkey is better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, birds can fly much better than oh, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. <laughs> but you make an interesting point here, because <clears throat> what this structure does, it's uh, um, animals have specialized on many things. Mm. This structure seems to be the only structure that you can make more and more complicated without becoming more specialized. And so it, it mm. makes us more general purpose. Mm -hmm. um, this is why the, the brain is, I think, the only organ that, when it becomes more complex, uh, does not specialize its functions, but it expands the range of functions. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it has been an evolutionary uh, bestseller. <laughs> so, I would like to give you one example, which illustrates how strong the inherited knowledge is in determining how we perceive in that it is very difficult to overcome these constraints that are set. And this is a visual example, um, but there are, of course, many others, and the philosophers might sometimes consider that even the way in which they reason may be constrained. <coughs> because sometimes... If you, if you have a look at these two pictures, if you look to the left one, um, you see a concave, oops, you see concave ditches. See, this, this goes inwards. And on the other side, these are protrusions. Mm. It comes out. Mm. 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 Huh? <coughs> Everybody will see it that way. Yeah. Now, I tell you, this is, the, the left one is just upside down. It's just turned around. It's the same object. Uh, it just turned around. <laughs> and the reason is that your brain, because of evolutionary structuring, thinks light comes from above, which is natural because the sun is usually up. Mm -hmm. So when light comes from above and something has the shadow in yes, the upper part, yes. it is concave, mm -hmm. it is hollow. Mm -hmm. And if the shadow is below, it must, be, must protrude. And now you know why you perceive this differently. But you still continue to see it differently. So it doesn't help you to know that the brain computes something very complicated here in order to make this appear like this or appear like that. You still see it as you see it. And this happens with nearly everything we perceive. And the problem is that uh, this will happen all the time we, we perceive, we reason, we conclude. We are guided by the architecture of our brains. And we don't know to which extent this is the case. We only know it is the case. And this makes it, um, again, very difficult um, to know where, since we cannot discuss about this, it, it is our primary perception. 
Um, we don't know to which extent we can transcend beyond these mm -hmm. fixed schemata according to which we think and perceive and conclude, which is the same argument as in the beginning. We know we are constrained, but we don't know where the boundaries are. That's it. So I would like to briefly come back. I would come back, like to come back to the question, how come that consciousness came onto this planet, given the evolution of the brains in this gradual way? And we can say a little bit about it. If you take a simple brain, like brain of rat up here, and you follow the flow of information through these brains, you see that there's a fairly short path from the sensory systems, the receptors, eye, ear, nose, mm -hmm. tongue, to regions in the cerebral cortex that process this information, and then to executive structures like the motor system, mm -hmm. and then out again for reactions. Now, when the brains become more and more complex during evolution, more and more of these areas of the cerebral cortex are added, and I have painted them here in, as these blue ovals. Mm -hmm. And one can now look <coughs> at the way in which they are connected to the other structures that have already existed. And there's a fascinating observation that these new areas that have come during evolution more and more, mm. and in humans it's mainly areas up front here, and areas in this, in this region. Yes, sir. Uh, these late coming areas are no longer connected to the periphery. They are connected to the areas that have already been evolved. So, which means. Can you, what do you mean by periphery? Uh, the sensory periphery, the surface, the outer mm. surface, mm. sense organs, eye, mm. nose, ear. Mm. Mm. And now comes an interesting point. These new... These new areas, they are organized in exactly the same way as the older ones. The internal structure and therefore the function is exactly the same. But the only difference is that they now get the information not from the eye or from the ear, but they get information that has already been processed Mm. by zone area. And this process is repeated. So the result of the first area is processed again by the second area, is processed again by the third, is processed again, can be sent back all the way down and be circled again. Mm. And I have indicated with these arrows that all these areas talk to each other. Mm. And so the suspicion we have, the hypothesis is that Consciousness has become possible because of this uh, repetition of cognitive processes. Um, you have a primary representation of an object, which is happening somewhere in these early areas. Use the cursor. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, here it is. It makes jump the picture when I move it. Anyway, 
Um, so there, there is an early representation. It's strange, but it's electrostatic, I think, which makes it jump. Um, and then this representation that is already the result of a computation is, is again taken as the optical. Um, can we dim the, the light of the projector? Or the light here? Dim the overhead lights? Yeah, overhead lights, yeah. No, because we can't see the cursor well. Ah, the, the, cursor yeah. well. the, the mouse, that's better, yeah. We change the cursor to black. Yeah. This is very clear. Oh. Yeah, you have a good picture here, but... Oh. Yeah. There's others. <coughs> there is. Okay. You can right-click and change the mouse. Oh. Right-click. Oh. Uh, and it's already working. Uh, Left-click. Pen color. No, no, don't do that. Never mind. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, no. Intro, no. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, this repetition of cognitive processes to take the result of the first lower level cognitive process, subject it to the same process, subject it again to the same process, maybe bring it back to the beginning and then circle several times, in principle opens the possibility to have a representation of a representation of a representation, so to create meta-representations. And this could be the trick that evolution used so that higher brains can have a protocol of their own functions, that they can watch their own processes because they subject them to a normal cognitive process. ก็ชาวเทวะเฉยสิกันมาชิบเฉยเฉยวันนี้นิ่งบ่กี่ยูเทเบกะเลยอ่ะโคยูเลยชาวเฉยดูกันแล้วตะนิ่งบ่ชิ
can reach the level of consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. This is the gateway. Yes. So we don't have access to everything we know except if our emotions and our attention system select appropriately from moment right. to moment to moment, yeah. which further constrains our ability. Complete agreement. Um, the second was you said that we don't know the boundaries of constraint. And I w would you at some point tell us whether there has been specific experiments trying to penetrate those boundaries of constraint? I don't know that there have been, but if there are, would you mention them? I don't know of any. I think it would be very difficult to design them. Because, um, yeah. Just, just our last point. Uh, your description of the emergence of consciousness is very exciting, and this idea of being able to watch. And I w wondered whether you, there's a basis in brain science to say whether that capacity is more possible to watch or reflect afterwards than to watch at the moment of experience. Because でたまてきやなばてゆとちゅうとしとえじょばてたちゅうとがなてたにゃんぼりやにすすすりやちきししんぐそらちちゃれちゃえきちごちちゅうやるちえけじしそたてちゅうとよなにちゃわるむすじ
But, now, but the, the other related point, if I can just make one other brief point, is that one interesting issue for this dialogue is that with certain kinds of mind training, there are domains that have been unconscious for most people, which we may be able to bring to the level of consciousness, which may then confer certain advantages. And that's, that's a, a hypothesis. Lojan. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, this is an extremely interesting point and it is useful to distinguish implicit knowledge from explicit knowledge. Can you give an example? Yes, of I would like to give an example. Yes, sir. When, <coughs> when children learn until the age of three or four, they do not have uh, what we call declarative memory. They learn, but they do not remember the context in which they learned. If you tell them, um, like the rule system of the language, they will just learn it implicitly and, and use it, but they don't remember that they have learned it. Mm. Or if they are instructed by the mother, uh, don't go here because it's dangerous, because it, it gives reasons. Mm. Child will not go there on the next day. You ask the child, why don't you go there? And the child will give the reasons. And then you ask the child, where do you know this from? And the child will say, well, it's obvious. As if it, it does not remember where it has learned it. And this is implicit knowledge. You don't, you don't know the cause of what you know. And of course, everything that you know from evolution is of this kind. You have not been there. Uh, mm. But we mm. have mm. this knowledge. So mm. we apply it. Mm. 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 Are also obscure to consciousness. To consciousness, and some forms of implicit knowledge are not obscure. Because you just gave an example of implicit knowledge that is not obscure. Because the child knows the reasons, just doesn't know the origin of the reasons. Right. So, so the so implicit. We have some kinds of there's a Tibetan term, mundumbirwa and mundumbirwa. So some kinds of implicit knowledge are we don't know them. We just we can use the knowledge, but we don't know it. And some kinds of knowledge we know it, but we don't know where it came from. Both right. of these are implicit. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. There's a, a whole hierarchy. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that this part of this implicit knowledge, when you don't know where it comes from, becomes <coughs> convictions. And you are not able to, to, to relativate them. You, you don't discuss about it. You don't discuss about the fact that it is an object, although it is a, a definition that results from evolutionary knowledge about what an object is. You use knowledge in order to identify it, but you are not aware of it. And, if somebody tells you this is not an object, you would just not discuss. And I think part of the cultural um, mishaps that occur, because people cannot understand each other, is because their cognition has been early primed in this implicit way. And they see the same thing, but it feels different, and it looks different to them. But you have no way to explain to the other that there is this difference, because you can't put it into any relation. And we have this problem, I think, in the moment, in a very, very uh, acid way. Evan has a comment. I would just like to make a, a very quick uh, remark that it is important to keep clear the distinction between a, a process that is conscious and our conscious knowledge of that process. 
So our conscious knowledge of that process is a matter of introspection. But a conscious process does not have to be one that is necessarily introspectable. So a bat navigating its environment through sonar may have phenomenal awareness of its environment in the form of, of the sonar system but has no capacity for introspection. A very, very young infant may have all, a whole range of phenomenal, aware, conscious processes or states, but with no introspective ability. So introspection is a kind of higher order consciousness, but is not consciousness as such. Yeah. <laughs> だね、だからさ、で、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、ずっと、
공해 왕식이 그게 메시지 기원도 그렇다. 네가 하는 기원도 있다로 망신. 나른 나른. So um, most so of the thought, why? So most of the thought processes that we experience um, as human beings, in uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary, on, on level. ordinary level, they all follow after some form of sensory modalities. Right. Mm. But um, I think you can see this very nicely in in the graph. For phenomenal awareness, just mm. for primary sensory experience, uh, this circuit is enough. Yeah. Like to hear a tone and make a response to a tone. And because rats have this phenomenal awareness for sure. But in order to have no input and reason and do what you do in meditation, for example, and you see this very nicely, neurons that are sitting here in these higher areas, they only talk to neurons sitting in other higher areas. It's a, it's a closed system. Mm. And you can disconnect it completely from the periphery. Oh, and it will still oh, work. So can they, can they be connected to the periphery as well? You can have, you can have a... You can have a stimulus that is, in other words, those, the higher cortex can operate in isolation from the periphery, yeah. but it can also relate to the periphery. Yes, of course, but yeah. you can decide, depending on your attentional mechanisms, whether you take into consideration <coughs> what comes in here, you can also ignore it completely yeah. and still go on and process stored information, deliberate and run through these circles. Uh, it's, um, the, the, the higher the system becomes, the more autonomous it becomes oh, relative yeah. to the periphery. 새 토르토르 지상구 새 토르치면 뒤쪽이 즉 자외 왕설이야. 라와 체르르치. 왕설에 뜨는 라와 체르르치 용도도스. Although one interesting issue and I don't know how you what you think of this wolf is that some emotional areas of the brain like the amygdala have connections all the way down to the primary sensory cortices. And so the emotional areas seem to be very much connected to the sensory systems. Well they get different information they get very he talks about structures that make you afraid or startled mm -hmm. there is some direct path from the sensory organ to the structure if you see a spider you want to be yes. very quickly uh -huh. but um, the same structures are also used to make you bad feelings after you have an incoherent thought mm -hmm. so you also have input to these structures from these very high areas and so self-generated concepts, if they don't, if there is a conflict, also activate these structures, which then make you feel uneasy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are different ways to these structures, uh, but they're always the same. Value assigning systems. Then you you emotions you Then you you temper this bit, then this shook to which you ever could do the debate emotion window. Emotional tensis how much the emotion go away. Yes, you know, I'm told So, what are the conga, the emotion, some of the ombus owns of the jetters, as it were, ombus of the jetters. This is Amygdala, because oh. you were talking about um, amygdala, so that's the basis of um, one of them. Uh, one of them. One, one of several structures that are important for emotion. It's a, it's a emotion. The give a kudoliya, the give kanda, the shiver, the watch, the watch. What the draw to some? The re, the re, the re. This one. Just one. No. Ah, just that. That means now when you're ganzing, when you shock some give a kudoliya, the emotion man draws some. The answer draw I have some. Yes. So you. That means that I'm going to get that. I mean, of course, this is something internal to the Buddhist kind of debate, but um, you mentioned the fact that um, the, the, the emotion centers, particularly the amygdala, 
is uh, directly connected with um, the, this this very you know uh, primary phenomenal awareness mechanism. Uh, so, uh, what about um, in the case of Buddhism, a strong sense of grasping itself? So, from the Buddhist point of view, it's an, it's an afflicted state of mind. So, would you say that would be also directly connected to the sensory? Um, I think that's emotion. From the Buddhist yeah. viewpoint, from yes. the Dhimmika viewpoint, the point, yeah. that's the emotion. So yes. The fundamental emotion. Yes, yes. And, and so, that, but the Surah Surah Khan Mimidwa. But that object is not any of the external objects like, you know, form, oh. sounds, and so on. It just wants oneself. So, um, so probably they are not, it's not related directly to the, the sensory experiences. I don't know. But, yeah, that doesn't but, but I think His Holiness <laughs> is raising a very interesting yeah. point. And I think that uh, to the extent that uh, one, one component of what, when we, uh, when, a, when a Western psychologist uses the term self, one component that is often referred to are memories related to oneself, this sense of grasping may mm. distort, if you will, or, or modulate the memories related to the self. Uh, and so there may be, uh, uh, and the, the brain is, is, is wired to allow that to happen. It's also the case that even, um, uh, simple reward which may produce grasping will affect how the brain processes visual information from very, you know, at the very earliest stages of, of, the, of the visual cortex. So that there are many different stages at which grasping or other afflictive processes can affect the information processing in the brain. No. Just following on Richie's comment, um, I believe there's some work in neuroscience that suggests a, a distinction between liking, um, sort of, you know, appreciating the pleasurable qualities of something, and wanting. And that, that seems very relevant to this important distinction in Buddhism about you know, the sort of destructive effect of, of the grasping emotion. Um, unfortunately, I do not know much more than that, than just that, that um, these two kinds of kind of uh, positive valence um, exist and, and are implemented in different parts of the brain, but maybe Richie could fill in what I can't remember. Well, very briefly, uh, there is this distinction between liking and wanting, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this has been studied in the context of addiction initially. Uh, to distinguish between uh, an individual's uh, response to an addictive substance, and uh, one of the outcomes of that research is that uh, what addiction does is it actually uh, strengthens the wanting but decreases the liking. Yeah, wonderful. And there are also different chemicals in the brain mm. which mm. are more related to one versus another. Didn't 
This may not be directly re- related to um, what we are discussing here, but uh, in, the, in the Buddhist text, there is a discussion of the status of um, the o- dream objects, the objects in a dream, and they are referred to as uh, man- uh, so tall, yeah. Yeah. and they 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 are understood to be subtle kind of forms, and they are referred to as the mental object forms, um, and so the suggestion here is that in the dream <laughs> state. <laughs> uh, so and there are different types of mental object forms, but this is one of them. And the suggestion here is that uh, uh, in the dream state, um, the experience the, uh, of awareness or, or conscious experience is only at this mental level, not the sensory level. <laughs> but when you experience the dream, you can experience also the, the, the image of the colors as well. <laughs> so, and the, the object exists. That's <laughs> So, uh, since it is a kind of a form, and it's not an object of the sensory uh, perceptions, therefore it is referred to as the mental object forms. So, when someone has that kind of experience in that dream state, um, would you say that the, the sensory apparatus at the, at the kind of primitive phenomenal awareness level are they still active or no? Yeah, th- this is an extremely important point you make oh. here. And there are data on it. Mm. Um, and the data are taken from, uh, not from dreaming people, because mm. it's difficult to know when they dream, mm. but from... Oh, uh, it's in me, this <laughs> Can't you... Wrap it up, yeah. Oh. But oh. the correlation is not so good. <laughs> I see, I see. Uh, <laughs> but you can oh, do it... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it with uh, so with is patients. saying that... Um, who have hallucinations. His Holiness was saying that uh, the scientific explanations that he has heard earlier is being now being repudiated by the later <laughs> presenters. Oh. <laughs> <They're> skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Oh. But something that, that is related is the hallucination of patients with schizophrenia. And, uh, when they, no. they see or hear... The yeah. mm. the mm. the mm. Good to know now that the Jews Rarer <laughs> ちょっと止められ、こちらで。ちょっと待って。右通行るわ。ね。ああ、見なくて。ただ、それでもらってすごいわ。ね。かさだ。で、筋筋の顔、筋筋の顔、治るじゃろわた。ね。ちょちょち
and you do it yourself and you know it's your own imagination. You activate your speech centers, all of them. In addition, you activate centers up here. That you need in order to... Sonia was wondering whether it's hallucination based on something that you see and you misconstrue like a mirage. So I was mentioning that it's purely internal. Purely internal. In case of schizophrenia, it doesn't have to be a misinterpretation of, a, no. of an outer object. There's nothing outside. Yes. It's all generated inside. Yeah. And it is perceived as if it came from outside. And the reason is that in schizophrenia, unlike when we just imagine something, they do not activate only the higher brain centers which you activate when you imagine speech, but activity spreads all the way down to the primary sensory regions so that the pattern which these brains generate internally is indistinguishable from a pattern that would occur if there was a speaker outside. And this is probably the reason why these people cannot distinguish between self-generated and coming mm. from outside. Mm. Mechanism is not quite known. And this brings us to another very, very important question. How does the brain know when it is right? And how does it know when it is wrong? And how can it distinguish activity Remember, it's only neurons making complex spatiotemporal patterns of activity all the time, self-active. And there must be an instance in the brain, and this gets us to the next point of the self, that is able to distinguish activity, which is just computations, no result yet, and the result. And then it can even know internally, self-referentially, whether this result is valid, or probably valid, or maybe wrong. And so this self-referentiality is a big mystery, mystery because we don't know how it's done. Yes. <laughs> Tidak <laughs> 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 Lot Um, so, from the Buddhist epistemological perspective, um, this this issue of how does you know how, how how does the cognitive processes I mean from Buddhist language know it's right and it's wrong, and that question may be easier on the sensory level because there's a kind of a reference to the to the object, but it becomes more complex at the level of the mental processes. And here, uh, in the epistemological text, there is already a recognition that, for example, when you are mentally perceiving something which is actually a valid form of knowledge, in the, in the state itself, when you're actually exp having the knowledge, uh, there is nothing that would allow you to verify that this is a true instance of knowledge. That kind of verification can only come as a result of a subsequent evaluation, either by reference to an earlier experience or a memory, or some other uh, avenue. I think we need to take a tea break. Mm. So we will take a 15 minute break and uh, we'll come back to the self. Okay. Uh, 
two key problems that uh, relate to challenges that you raised uh, in your book, Your Holiness. Uh, one has to do with the issue of the self and whether there is a self and its location, uh, and the other concerned with relations between mind and brain. So, Wolf, please. Wasn't Anton <clears throat> asking a question that would be optimistic? Hmm. Hmm. I want to add a, a very optimistic touch. Uh, you know, we have learned from we have learned from Professor Singer that was a side remark, but that is very important that the brain is the only uh, organ or system which we developed, which became more complex, but at the same time did not become more specialized. Okay? Uh, now this statement, to me, opens up the possibility that actually our cognitive abilities are not limited. And the reason why I say that is, from computer science, we know the notion of what is called a universal computer. This was invented by uh, someone called Alan Turing. A universal computer is a computer which is able to solve any mathematical problem. And such a universal computer works with very limited resources. It doesn't have to be very complex. Now, I can see a reason that evolution developed the brain such that it is a universal computer in a sense, that it can solve in principle any problem. The only limit now being the size of the memory and the time it would take to solve a problem. But now something comes in which is very human. We are the only species which are able to expand the size of the memory which we have. We can use books, we can use computers for memory and so on. And we are also the only uh, species which can expand the time it takes. We can expand the time it takes even beyond our own lifetime. This is the invention of culture. Future generations can continue working on problems on which we work mm -hmm. and maybe find a solution. So this is just an optimistic point, <laughs> point I would like to add. <laughs> Just to add one caveat, maybe, which is the universal computer that Turing spoke about can pose any problem that is well defined to within the framework of mathematics. But we seem to be very often thinking about sort of ill defined things, which may not be so. Who knows, maybe. <laughs> Let's wait for the next generation to solve it. <laughs> we are optimists. Um, I would like to... I, I think everybody is optimistic. <laughs> Therefore, we come here. Uh, uh, if there's no basis of opti optimism, optimism yeah. there's no reason to come here. <laughs> uh. It's a self-selected group. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. So, so, to, uh, uh. so uh, Matthew? Yes, just about the limitations. Uh, we were talking also with Anton at the break. Uh, we may conceive a limitation in terms of uh, the number of in information a single person in a single lifetime could gather. But when it comes to developing human qualities, you know, who can say there's a limitation to compassion, to altruism, to inner peace? I mean, how you do, will you define that kind of limitation? <laughs> because the, it's not something that is uh, basically quantitative. Uh, it's a matter of depth, of, uh, of, of the, the purity and the intensity of the experience, but perhaps not uh, purely it's a qualia in a way. And so that's very also optimistic in terms of becoming a better human being, that you don't see why there should be a limitation to developing pure compassion or awareness and, and something like that. Yeah. Uh, 
On this question of uh, the limitless potential for the development of the qualities such as compassion, uh, even from the Buddhist point of view, he is saying that there is um, a, 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 you know, an, an issue here because one of the supposition is to understand that the basis upon which these qualities. No, no, I, I, I think it's, for Buddhist, I think not much problem. But Buddhist idea come to in common common level very difficult. Very difficult. Because one of the, the key premises is that the basis upon which these qualities arise is... Uh, the good uh, quality of mind. Mind, yeah. No, yeah. mental level. Uh, that's the, the, basis. the whole sort of idea. The, because of the subtle mind, no beginning, no end. Always there. So, so the continuation is there. So therefore, uh, one lifetime, some experience, and the subtle way imprint on the subtle mind. So the next life, some uh, proper environment come. And then these oh, yeah. the seeds, uh, okay. these imprints, seeds imprints. or imprints in the mind then easily develop. So that's why you see, we believe the among the same student or even the same parent, some uh, in certain field very quickly learn. Some Less. Of course, a part of one part is from the the Hazoda, uh, particle. No. Oh, of course, uh, have some explanation. But then also, the previous sort of imprints. Uh, uh, imp imprints. Uh, imprints. Imprints. So in the case of children from the same parents, yeah, we oh. see these differences. So. Uh, did, so, so the the why why that's just like that. Kerala, that's just like that. 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 That's just like <laughs> okay. Could you tell us why? Uh, there's a kind of a debate going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Saying that. Thank you. Buddhist viewpoint is so important. Oh, so Buddhism idea is just common ground. So should be in it. In your order, it's important. Because we're bringing uh, an idea of a limitless potential for the development of qualities such as compassion, which is a Buddhist idea, into this level of this common discourse. And then so to convey another word, that. Another word. My usual so say. Secular ethics. ethics context. In that field, is it those because of the special because of the Buddhist special sort of reason or views, is it cannot cannot bring. But in 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 your book, Your Holiness, to quote, you say, while there are limitations on the nature of physical action or athletic skill, huh. there are essentially no limits on mental development. No limits. <laughs> Page one forty seven. <laughs> so, of course, that's from the Buddhist point of view. Yeah. Oh, the, the secular ethics kind of So, if it is. So, if the presentation is from the Buddhist perspective, then it is appropriate. But if it happened to be in a secular ethics context, mm -hmm. then that would be a slip of <laughs> tongue. <laughs> well, at some point, I think it would be wonderful for Your Holiness to amplify on this point because this is a critical issue oh. for, for Western scientists. Oh. Oh. Rarely do we encounter a domain in which it can be said that there are essentially no limits oh. on development. Uh, and I think that uh, this is something oh. where we would very much like to hear from you uh, to explain to us more about oh. what you mean by this. <laughs> First of all, we have the, the, the big challenge of how to prove uh, the reality of consciousness that is independent of, <laughs> uh, that is not that reducible uh, to brain. <laughs> I think answer only come, uh, some of us, if you spend at least a few months, uh, just to try to, because of that, actual experience, 
the luminosity survey. The, the luminous nature of mind, yeah. Uh, all thought stop. All sort of sensorial sort of level activity stop. The thought process also stop. Then stay there. Uh, a few occasions I try. So, uh, of course, not sufficient time. Uh, then you get, at the beginning, you get some kind of feeling of just nothing. Yeah. Kind of absence. Uh, then remain longer period. Then gradually just feeling the experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of a, just an experience. Yeah. So then, through one's own experience, then we can say, oh, there is mental. Yeah. There is a phenomenon. There is a mm. primary phenomenon. Yeah. phenomenon. But then we have a very interesting problem. Uh, Anton just said the limitlessness mm. of our capacities comes because we can rely on the next generation to build on us mm. and take the knowledge we have acquired because we can pass on this knowledge acquired at lifetime as far as the explicit knowledge that is available to third-person perspective. But the knowledge you talk about is only mm -hmm. accessible mm -hmm. from the first person yes, perspective. Right. Uh, and is it possible to transmit a qualia across a generation? Or does not every generation have to start from scratch? And now I understand why you need incarnation. Because yes. otherwise it would not yeah. work. Oh, that's that's, that's, yeah, that's a rebirth, yes. Yeah, that's rebirth. True. So that's a complicated yeah. issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a critical one. Yes, all right. All right. So yeah. the limitlessness of mental development may depend upon rebirth. But that's not to say that our assumptions about the limits of mental development within science might not be readily challenged by Buddhism. There could be still quite a lot of development even in a single lifetime, as Matthew was yeah. referring to. There yeah. still yeah. may be a yeah. tremendous yeah. potential yeah. for development, yeah. even if it's not limitless, still yeah. a tremendous yeah, potential. Yes, through training of mind. And, and we we well, can well, improve, right? Increase. Well, maybe science increase. can help uh, to have crash and courses. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, there may be other methods that yeah. are faster. It's possible. And one of the main drama of our modern world and existence is we vastly underestimate the power of transformation of mind. Pagiric. We are ready Pagiric. to do so much for develop our health. We, know we do jogging on this bicycle that goes nowhere. And we do all kinds of things to, to <laughs> learn and everything. But we are so uh, almost powerless to know how we could use that potential of uh, human transformation. And that's maybe the best contribution that we could Pagiric. do. Yeah. No, no, no. I think up to now, I think majority of the people, I think never pay attention about our inner value. That's the problem. Yeah. Mm. So always, you see, uh, seeking answer from externally. Outside. No. Ah. Outside. No. Outside. There's so much in there. Yeah. Much mm. more of the brain is occupied with its own management then is actually dealing with the outer environment. Mm. Um, so we don't need the environment for a long time. Yes? Should we go to the self? Yes, yes. yes. Let's go to the self. Let's go to the self. Um, and I think this is an interesting point because here, Western science, um, comes to a conclusion that is much closer to what uh, Buddhist philosophy um, intuitively developed than what Western um, belief systems have developed. And it's very strange that uh, we made this mistake in the West and then with science we disprove ourselves and get much closer to what you have always been saying. Um, so, of course, neurobiologists are convinced that all mental functions, so also the self, the mind, um, is based on your, are based on neuronal processes. So this has an important implication. Um, these mental phenomena cannot precede the neuronal phenomena, but they must follow them. Because that? Um, then the mental processes are getting less than the temperature. And then the kitty, uh, let's go 
So this, this raises a problem with the causation of behavior by mental phenomena. Mm -hmm. We think that everything is prepared by neuronal interactions and that part of this becomes conscious, mm -hmm. much does not become conscious, and that when it enters consciousness, it's always after it had already been prepared in the neuronal process. <laughs> So um, you spoke about some processes becoming conscious and some not becoming conscious. So we seem to be using the word consciousness in a, in a, in a different sense. So exact so, meaning. So what's the exact meaning? Um, I, I would say that conscious contents... Mm -hmm. Consciously said it, mother. Yes, if something is in consciousness, you can talk about it, you know about it, mm -hmm. you can put it into declarative memory, and you, re you can recall it in a context-dependent way. And it can also, contents in consciousness give you the argument. Mm -hmm. You can say, I yes. did this because, and so forth. Mm -hmm. While if it's not in the consciousness, um, if you're not consciously aware of the whatever made you do this, uh, you cannot talk about it. You can say, I did it, but I don't know why. So this would be the operational definition. Now, ま、て、あの、ゲストだ。お、トミシバだ。うん。と、トクジェ。ナス。ただ、サンゲジェアクジルバだ。こう、だって、サンゲジェアマレディ。こう、ティーム。ただ、ただ、ドシスドね。オム
in the other cases where they actually see it, put it in short-term memory, and can talk about it. And the performance is about the same in the two cases. But you can then show that the pattern of electrical activity in the two cases is very different. Oh. The stimulus that is just processed and produces a response generates local activity, which is an oscillatory pattern. But there's oh, very little... Oh. There's very little um, communication or coordination of activity across wider brain areas. And the stimulus that gets consciously perceived produces about 200 milliseconds after it is presented a brief state during which l many of these areas um, oops, many of these areas widely distributed across this mantle here of this cortical sheet for a brief period of time not very long 100 millisecond or 200 millisecond they very precisely synchronize their activity they all go together for a brief moment of time. And that's the only difference. Uh, it's, a, it, it's an increased amount of coherence, which is reflected in a, a high degree of synchrony over many, many different areas for a sufficiently long period of time. And if this happens, the brain as a whole says, I have perceived consciously. And then there are a number of secondary processes. Once this has happened, it's like lighting a fire, getting over a threshold. Once this has happened, then the um, process starts, which puts the information in short-term memory, <coughs> keeps it there, then you have access to, to the language areas, and you can see all these secondary processes <coughs> happening. But the, the main difference seems to be that the activ activity produced by the stimulus is in the one case uh, just producing local responses that go through the system until it gets out in the motor system. And in the other case, it ignites um, a holistic pattern of activity that is very coherent. And this makes the difference between conscious and subconscious processing. That's all we know so far, mm. not much. Senyorosan Tang now, what is so interesting in this context is that um, the, the results of Richard Davidson on meditating Buddhist monk, they find when they get in deep state of meditation, pattern that looks very similar to the pattern mm. that you have when you consciously experience. Mm. They also see increased synchronization mm. of these high frequency oscillations. And so it looks as if when you meditate, you 
bring contents which are somewhere in the brain, because there is no outer stimulation, mm. at the level of consciousness, using the same mechanism that in perception you use in order to make something conscious, to coordinate the activity in widespread areas of the brain, and probably it's different areas than in, in conscious perception. I don't know what you activate, uh, what you, uh, you couldn't tell us probably. But <laughs> <laughs> From outside it looks similar. That's all one can say. One of the differences uh, in case of uh, trying to rest in the pure awareness or whatever, is that there's no specific content. Yeah. It's, it's the most refined aspect of, of awareness in a way. So it's a... It's the, the, pure aspect of consciousness you are talking about, but without precisely the, the content. You are not aware of, 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 of a dog having come in the room, but it's the pure awareness process in a way, which is quite So maybe you just can focus this activity <laughs> on these high areas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I would just like to introduce <coughs> Philosophers always like to introduce distinctions, but I'm going to introduce another one because it seems very close to what you were talking about when you talked about sensory awareness or sensory content and then something being manifest to the person. So in Western philosophy and in cognitive science, we often distinguish between what is called phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. And the idea Double here... What, eh? no. what do you mean by access? I'm going to explain. I'll give an example. Oh. The idea here would be, suppose you have a rapid emotional experience. It happens very fast and there's a feeling that has a certain kind of tone of fear or, or pain or avoidance or withdrawal. And it has a felt character, but it happens very quickly. That's an example of phenomenal consciousness. But access consciousness ref would refer to your ability to conceptualize what's happened to you, to use it in subsequent reasoning, to have it play a role in memory to guide or control your behavior. And the point here is that not all of the contents of phenomenal consciousness are necessarily available to access consciousness. And that would seem close to the distinction between a kind of sensory quality and manifest to the person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the self, sorry. Um, there is a striking <coughs> discrepancy between gap. 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 Oh. The, the intuition that we have on our brains at least between the Western intuition on how the brain works and how science uh, thinks the brain works. And this is... Um, <clears throat> the Western intuition is this, and this is a, a drawing by Descartes, that um, because we experience consciousness as a unitary phenomenon, we experience ourself as something that is unity, um, <coughs> we think that when we observe, there is a point in the brain where all the information must come together because we experience the world is closed and coherent. Um, that there is a center somewhere in the brain uh, where everything comes together, is interpreted, where decisions are reached, plans are made, and where the self sits and says, me. And this is a very Western idea. And it has... Uh, transpired Western philosophy since, since the antique times. It had always been like that. And Descartes even tried to find this place. And he had his assistants, philosophers, cut brains of cows to look for a structure which exists only once. Mm -hmm. And since the brain is symmetrical bilaterally, mm -hmm. um, there are only two structures which occur only once. And this is the epiphysis. <laughs> It's in the middle. And, and there's another one, the hypothesis. Now, Descartes uh, said this is it. The dark net. Now, he was wrong. French, <laughs> French philosopher, Descartes, um, French philosopher. So, what, what we see today 
is, and I apologize for the German writing here, uh, I got it wrong, uh, <clears throat> is that there are these many, many different areas in the cerebral cortex. And they all do different things. And they are specialized for certain subfunctions. And um, they all do the same computation, but they get different information. Now, we also know how they are connected. And this is this, is this what you see here. Um, uh, apologies for the protector. Not it's much nicer what His Holiness sees here. Um, but um, each of the black points that you see in this graph, they represent um, a cortical area with millions and millions of neurons. And each of these colorful connections, which you don't, don't see well, um, they stand for massive projections between those uh, areas. So each of these black points is a cortical area, the ones you have seen before, those colorful things. Mm -hmm. And what the point of this diagram is, is taken from a cat brain, but if you did it from a monkey or a human brain, it would look the same, uh, would just be even more complex, is that there is no point of convergence in such brains. There's a, there's a hint of a hierarchy, mm -hmm. but there is no president, there is no director, mm -hmm. no conductor, but it is a highly distributed system where everybody talks to everybody, more or less. And <clears throat> in this system, extremely complex spatio-temporal patterns of activity mm -hmm. emerge. It is always active. And you must imagine that um, if a percept is generated there, like, like a dog that is barking and you touch the fur, mm -hmm. then you have activity in the visual areas, in all of them. Some are interested in motion, others in color, yet others in shape. You have the, the auditory areas active because they process the, the, the barking, the sound, and you have the, the somatosensory areas active because you touch the fur. But there's no place in this brain where the whole dog would be represented in a point. You have a spatio-temporally distributed pattern of activity that is extremely complex, and this is the simplest, not further reducible description of the representation of a barking dog with a particular fur. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go from there to the motor, pattern, motor to the output, <clears throat> there's a parallel stream of activity to the motor centers, which are again many, 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 mm -hmm. many. and it produces a complex pattern there. Um, which eventually makes you either run away from the dog because you are afraid or... So there's no point of convergence. <clears throat> Nothing ever comes together. It stays distributed. It just talks to each other. So you have these, these widely encompassing spatiotemporal activity patterns and nothing more. <clears throat> and that raises the question, how does it work? Why can this system think about itself, that it has a self that is uh, mm -hmm. a point somewhere? Uh, how do you get the unity of, of perception? Um, and these are the big, big, big questions in neuroscience that are unresolved. Because also here is the problem of how a material process um, does the phase transition into something that we experience as mental, as non-material. It's probably information probably something that emerges only when we talk to each other and uh, mirror each other in, in these systems, <laughs> that these concepts can, can come into the world, but they are here now. Now we have the problem. Um, so um, the question is, how are these many distributed processes bound together? Uh, how can such a system take the initiative, decide on something? And then, as we already said, how does it know that something that has emerged in there is correct? There must be certain patterns which are better than others, but we don't know what the signature is for goodness. And so I will, I will jump over many steps. There, there, there would be the possibility in classical thinking that if you have many different parts that you want to bind together, you produce a hierarchy connections up to the Dalai Lama or to president or whatever. This is not, we one could do this with anatomical connections. But this is not how it is done. 
because it cannot be done that way, uh, because you would need too many of these pyramids for all objects of the world, for all possible contents. You can't have isolated pyramids. So it's done in this distributed way. And the question is, how does this system organize itself? Because in such a distributed system, you have um, an individual neuron must say two things at the same time. It must speak two languages at mm. the same time. All it can do is discharge electrical pulses. It has nothing more. It must tell... <laughs> so it, it must tell the, the rest of the brain um, the, the feature for which I'm responsible, because some neurons like red color, green color, black, and so on, is present. And it does this by increasing the activity it produces. So the others know black is there. But at the same time, the neuron must tell the others, I am part of a large family of neurons, which in this very moment um, represents this mouse. So it must at the same time have a, another code in which it says, we are related. And... Okay. So imagine, for example, there is someone who has a mental problem, say like a schizophrenia, yeah. and has this hallucination. Mm. Um, at the brain level, is the expression localized or is it all distributed? Some particular lo well, location? His holiness, you should become a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> you are a scientist. Because... Um, you just discovered something. Um, it is so that the, this code that mm. is used as a code of relations mm. Mm. is the synchrony in time. Mm. If things happen together, yes. everybody knows this is related. Mm. If they happen out of phase, mm. it's not related. Now, in normal perception, and in conscious perception in particular, mm. these large families of neurons, they synchronize their activity yes. with high precision over large oh. areas. We talked about this already. Oh. Now, in schizophrenic patients, this is disturbed. They cannot produce these precise temporal relations. They can oscillate in high frequencies, but they cannot properly synchronize. And this is probably oh. the reason why they have this... So, could you say, for example, in terms of... Now, in terms of kind of temporal... If, if we were to look at this problem from a temporal perspective, can you say that this... this Loss of short, short period. Yes. From where it starts. So this loss of synchrony, synchronicity um, synchrony, can we say it begins from this particular point or simultaneous? Or is it simultaneous? Um, it's a very quickly spreading. You have many oscillators. If yes. you think about no. many oscillators, which are coupled, no. and they do this, but start, and then there is a, a very quick phase transition, self-organizing no. phase transition, in which they get organized. So, oh, so is it this loss of synchrony is simultaneously distributed? Yeah. Or does it start from somewhere? Well, you can... Is it propagated from one point? Um, good or question. So that is the seed of self. Because it's always the same. <laughs> thing. Well, if it starts from one localized area, that could be the seed of self. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, good point. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> my, guess, my guess would be no, because oh. it emerges from... The synchrony emerges from reciprocal interactions among many partners. And you, in such a case, you can't really say um, who is starting. Mm -hmm. um, it is mm -hmm. an emerging state. Yes, it's a problem. From all parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they pull each other in face. And you don't know exactly, there is no master puller. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Mm. Um, it's a self-organizing process. But you can see it nicely in brain scan, uh, in electrical images. So, if, for example, you, you look at such a picture, uh, you may see a face. Uh, down mm. here, you don't see a face. Uh, and mm. then if you look at the brain activity, and here is the frequency of this oscillatory activity, and here is time, here is the face is shown, and around this time it is recognized. Mm. And if you recognize a face, then you have this in the particular frequency range, which is what is here, 25 hertz, you have this strong synchronization of activity if there is a face, which you don't have if, if there is no face. And, and schizophrenic patients have a problem with this. So, um, can we go back to the... Oh, that one, yeah. So, so in, in, in both instances, uh, for, for example, in the, in the first case, the first image, so you're looking at the same image, there's a temporal phase. So both case, appearance, you say. So there is the appearance of those visual stimuli in, in both instances. Now, in the first instance, at a certain point, you recognize the face, and then there is this neural expression of synchrony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the second case, because there is no recognition of the face, so there is no synchrony. Why, why that? Why is there no red in the lower image? Uh, because uh, the brain cannot make out a coherent representation. Yeah. It doesn't know what it is. No, it's even at the first impulse. The, claim, the idea here is that the first yellow is a, is a sense impression before it's been... Uh, interpreted. Well, that may be a, search, <coughs> a piece of search activity that is frustrated and then collapses. Hmm. But it's, it's, this one is perhaps a little bit easier to understand. Uh, this is a top-down view on the skull, hmm. and every point here is an electrode, so it takes activity from a particular hmm. part of the hmm. cortex. And all the black lines, they connect sites which during this phase go into this high synchrony. And you see that it comprises nearly the whole, the whole brain. Mm -hmm. And this is when the stimulus is consciously perceived. This is another experiment where you have conscious and subconscious mm -hmm. processing. And this is when it's processed, but not conscious. Mm -hmm. So the difference mm -hmm. between conscious and non-conscious is really, um, one would say, the, the, the neuronal correlate of a conscious state is, um, is written here, that it is a, a metastable state because it's very transient, of a non-linear dynamical system. Um, so, yeah, that's what it is, but uh, it doesn't help us much um, because it's a very abstract description. And if we would like to describe in <coughs> concrete terms the exact neuronal correlate of this conscious state, one would have to demarcate the activity of maybe a billion of neurons oh, yeah. in a huge matrix of numbers and say this is the correlate of a conscious experience. So it would be an extremely high dimensional vector. And this is the problem we are going to have, His Holiness. We will be more and more precise, describing more and more detail the neuronal correlate of a mental phenomenon. And it will be numbers, complex numbers, it will be spatial temporal patterns that are not imaginable because they will be high dimensional. Mm -hmm. And then the question comes, why are we doing all this? High dimensional is also. High dimensional is also. The things that are important are the things that are important. The things non-linear 
Um, what was this metastable? Metastable, uh, because it is <laughs> this is attractor dynamic. So it is something that is temporarily stable, then but then can immediately change, change huh? and it will never ever come back to the same place, yeah. because this is what makes time perceivable. That the brain never ever comes uh, back to where it was. Never in Galia. ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、